All right, no one uh, find Chief Casanova. We don't want people kicked out because we've hit the limit of room capacity, but it's good to see you all. Good afternoon. I'm State Representative Corey Paris. I represent the 145th District in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, and let's talk some equity, shall we? So first and foremost, we're here to talk about House Bill 6901, which is an act concerning a student loan reimbursement program for certain professions. And uh, I might say, and I think this deserves a round of applause, really proud for this concept here today. We're gonna make history here. It's often, it's often said that uh, where the federal government cannot achieve policy uh, successes, the state legislature must step in and fill the gap as a model of excellence for equity. Uh, this bill, essentially what it does is uh, it will help Connecticut residents who are hardest hit by the student loan debt crisis by reimbursing nearly $20,000 if the borrower does the following. Uh, graduates from a Connecticut-based college or university, including vocational schools, which we believe, again, provides equity for those in which uh, institutions they choose to attend. Uh, if they stay in Connecticut for five years, now it's five years prior to school or five uh, prior to their graduating or five years after, uh, they are under 40 years of age and they perform 50 hours of volunteers service per year for a certified 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, what this bill also does is improve racial and gender equity. And borrowers right now in our state uh, hold nearly $40,000 in student loan debt. Now, why is that important? Connecticut holds the fifth highest amount of student loan debt in the country. In the country, uh, $17.8 billion held in student loan debt. And that's disproportionately affecting black and brown communities. The average student loan for black and brown borrowers is nearly 50% higher than that of their white borrowers. And borrowers who are women, black and brown folks, are more likely to hold student loan debt, owe larger amounts of that debt, and experience more difficulty in repaying that loan than their white borrowers. And that is even worse dependent upon the profession such as mental health workers, child care workers, nurses, teachers, and those who are in the field of social services, including social workers. I don't know if we have any social workers in the house here today, do we? <laughs> now, the reason why this is so important is because we want to increase retra uh, retention and attraction to our state, not just our state institutions, but to our state. But we also want to enable folks to be more uh, stronger participants in our economy. 20 years after starting college, white borrowers median student loan fell, six, fell to 6% their debt. Whereas the median black borrowers still owed 95% of their loan. Black, black, excuse me, Hispanic borrowers own 90% of their loans and women were at 97% of their loans according to a 2019 report by the Institute on Assets and Social Policy. Now, this bill would establish a loan reimbursement pilot program for the state, and we believe that it is critically important for us to be able to get our state back on track. Now, we're just talking about fixing the student loan crisis, but when we're allowing for there to be $20,000 in disposable income to be freed up for black and brown communities, for women, for working families, what that means is that their car payments will go down, mm -hmm. their insurance rates will go down, and it makes them more likely to be eligible to buy a home. Right now, the average age for a homeowner to buy their first time home is 36. It's much higher for black and brown borrowers and for women. So we've got a lot of work to do, but by addressing this critical need, we will achieve a lot of great things for many in this state, which will create equity. I'm stood, I don't know if you could see all the people behind me. Uh, I feel the heat coming on, uh, but I'm standing behind, uh, standing with rather a ton of great advocates and a ton of uh, phenomenal legislators who are also passionate about this work in this bill. Uh, you'll also immediately following me here from Ingrid Alvarez de Marzo, who is a state director for the Hispanic Fed Federation. Immediately following her, you'll hear from my colleague, Rep. Christine Palm. Uh, following Rep. Palm, you will hear from Representative Gary Turco. And then after Gary Turco, you'll hear from Chris Estrada Perez, who is the executive director of the Student Loan Fund. And Following Chris, you'll hear from Rep. Anthony Nolan, and then I will come back up for any questions. Thank you all so much for being here. Let's get to work. Ingrid. Muy buenos dias, good afternoon. I'm Ingrid Alvarez, Vice President for Policy at Hispanic Federation. Um, and I'm going to park the equity issue for a second. 
because as a contributing member of this state, I'd like to talk to you about economic recovery, economic growth, and shared prosperity for all. And so there's no secret that our state has struggled for decades. Our population had peaked in 2013. Compared to other states, we continue to lose more population than New York, Massachusetts. Yet, when I look around this room just right now with the advocates and the allies, the average age for a Latina in the state of Connecticut is 27 years old. The only part of our state that acquired population as of our census is Fairfield County. That's not a surprise, it borders New York. That I want to contribute and build a Connecticut where our college graduates aren't lost to neighboring metropolitan areas. That the cost of living doesn't push us out and limit our ability to contribute, to innovate, and to build. So I want to thank Representative Paris, Representative Sanchez, Turco, Nolan, Representative Reyes, um, Representative Palm, for staying the course on this bill. Right? This is what policy in action looks like. And more than an act of solely delivering debt relief, what HB 6901 is, is a catalytic tool to contribute to our state's economic recovery and long-term prosperity. But let me share some facts. So the negative impact of student loan debt in this state decreases new business growth, lowers the rate of home ownership, lowers individual and collective worth. It keeps us stagnant and struggling in recuperating from a recession. And now, coupled with the economic trauma that we've yet to unpack from a global pandemic. It increases the difficulty in saving for retirement. It creates more stress on our social safety net programs. It increases the likelihood of delinquency, which limits, and in many cases, depending if you look like me or you come from BIPOC communities, absolutely closes the door at any type of economic empowerment over mobility. It continues to widen the generational inequality gap. And it continues to delay traditional milestones, such as owning a home, starting a family. But one of the things that I'd like to really hone on in, it's the impact on housing. One of the overbearing consequences of student loan debt is the diminished opportunity to buy a house in the state, in the state of Connecticut and across the US. A home represents the American dream. However, the reality is that student loan debt continuously strips away the opportunity to own a home for many borrowers. Reports show that 51% of all student loan holders say their student debt has de delayed them from purchasing a home by an average of seven years. For the data then demonstrates that among people with student debt, between the age of 24 to 32, home ownership rates fell nine percentage points. Between 2005 and 2014, double that for the overall population. It's hard not to see the apparent correlation between student loan debt and the ability to live, to keep a roof over your head. Countless young American dreams are put on hold for every $1,000 of debt that they own, $1,000. More specifically, for every $1,000 of debt, home ownership among recent college graduates has declined by 1.8%. We must also understand the intersectionality intertwined with the ability to buy a home due to student loan debt. For example, black students tend to owe more than they initially borrowed which results in higher debt burdens that affect long-term implications. I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna tell you why I start with housing. I'm a poor kid from the Bronx who education was that great equalizer. 
And so when you graduate, what do you do? You want to contribute. You want to contribute to your state's tax coffers, right? Individual income, property income. What, and, and, and the next step is what? Your white pivot fence, establish a family, good schools, right? I won't benefit from this bill. And so to the naysayers in opposition, this is a tool for all of us. I want to live and contribute to a state with booming local economies, with great schools, with the opportunity for people to keep roofs and have a home and a peace and an opportunity of the American dream. And for far too long in the state of Connecticut, that's been hard and denied to a lot of people in communities of color in particular. Right. And we lose nothing. This is the type of innovation and policy and action that the people's house demands. And again, we've yet to unpack economic trauma from a unprecedented global pandemic. And so why lose our vibrant, young, healthy human capital to neighboring states when we've invested in their education and their development so that they could stay right here at home and build the Connecticut of the future that for decades the people of this state continue to ask for. Thank you. Unlike my wonderful colleague, I did not grow up poor in the Bronx. I grew up privileged in West Hartford and white. And when I grew up, it was expected that my peers and I would go to college it was expected that we would graduate and get good jobs, we would pay off a little bit of debt, and we'd be on our way. So I want to talk about the mythology that people my age continue to promulgate on not only kids and graduates of color or women, but young white men as well, anybody who is young these days. And here's the fallacy. The math does not add up. When I hear people my age say, well, we did it. We pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. Why can't they? Nobody gave me a handout. Why can't they? Why do they eat so much avocado toast? <laughs> why, why don't they just do what we did? And bear with me, folks, while I tell you why they cannot, even if they wanted to, do what we did. Because here's what the math shows. In 1977, when I went to college, you could go to school, and the average cost was $20,000 for four years. In 2022, the average cost of four years in college was $309,242. The difference is a 6.4%. Compare that to buying a car. In 1977, a new car was about five grand. Now the average is 23,700. That's only a 1.88% increase. So it is easier to buy a car than educate yourself so that you can have a job to have that car take you to. Here's where it gets really interesting. The consumer price index, which measures relative uh, buying power of wages compared to inflation. In 1977, the federal minimum wage was $2.30, but the effective buying power based on costs at the time, according to the CPI, was $5.90. In 2022, the average, the federal uh, minimum wage was $7.25, but the CPI was $4.19. So put simply, college costs 15 times more than it did then, and yet the price of a dollar has dropped precipitously. So when you run that math, and I was never very good at math, that was not my strong suit, but even I can do this math, there is no way that that is not a runaway train for young people. So please, anybody listening who is of a certain age, who graduated from college in the 60s or 70s, or perhaps even the early 80s, our experience doesn't matter. It is 100% irrelevant. It has nothing to do with hard work or ethics or picking yourself up by your bootstraps. If you don't have boots, there are no straps. These people behind me are not to blame. 
And we have to stop blaming young people because we put them in this position and we damn well need to help them get out of it. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Gary Cherko, State Representative from the 27th District of Newington and New Britain. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, I've personally been working on this issue with a lot of my colleagues since I've been in the legislature for the last five years and I'm very excited this year. It looks like we have a great path to get this done. Uh, finally bring relief that many of our students need. I want to address, um, you heard a lot about the merits of this legislation and all it will do to help our young people, our workforce. I want to address some more of the concerns uh, by uh, some of the naysayers, uh, people in doubt about the need for this legislation, or some will say, um, you know, how is this fair? I recently did a forum with a group of people and I talked about this legislation, got a lot of applause, then I had a young woman raise her hand and say, well, what do you say to somebody that doesn't have any debt or already paid off their debt or uh, may, went to another path and didn't um, go to college and need to take on debt? And uh, what I want to say to those individuals with those concerns is that this legislation, helping reduce debt, helping attract individuals to the vital areas of our workforce, teachers, social workers, mental health workers, uh, social services workers, nurses, that attracting people to these vital fields helps everyone in our state helps our entire economy. Even if you're somebody that paid off your loans or didn't go, to your didn't go to college and have to take out any loans, this legislation is gonna help you because it's gonna help our entire state. Right, I mean, last time you checked, do we all need nurses? I mean, really, if you're in a hospital, you're in a nursing home, you give birth to a child, do you need nurses? Yes. If you have a child in school or you need child care services, you need teachers, right? We cannot get rid of nurses or teachers or child care workers. With all of the mental health concerns, especially through the pandemic, we need social workers, we need mental health counselors, we need people in the social services field. These are essential employees in our Connecticut workforce. We cannot get by as a state without these individuals. And right now, we have a shortage in every one of these fields. We are in fierce competition with our surrounding states, especially those states that may be able to pay more, they are more interesting places to live, like a Boston or New York City, Philadelphia to some people. We are in competition, so we have to provide Connecticut more of an incentive for these essential workers to stay here, to work here, to live here, to buy a home and to raise their family. This student loan debt relief program, up to 5,000 a year for four years for Connecticut residents who choose to stay here uh, is going to provide that add of incentive. It's going to attract people to these vital workforce fields and it's going to then help our entire economy. So that anyone out there saying, hey, this bill doesn't help me, unless you figured out a way to survive without mental health workers, social workers, nurses, teachers, child care workers, and you don't think it's important to have a vibrant workforce of these individuals, then this bill is for you. And these professions build the foundation for the entire Connecticut economy that we all rely on. So this bill helps every single person in Connecticut it needs to pass this year, and I thank you all for your support. Thank you so much, Representative Turco. My name is Krister Estrada Perez, and I am the Executive Director of the Student Loan Fund. Um, I have $78,000 in student debt as an undergraduate, first-generation student, poor working-class person of color. My mother graduated with an RN degree when she was in her 40s, um, and she has $90,000 in student debt, uh, including a 15,000 parent plus loan that she has for me to finish my education. She's a nurse right now in the state of Connecticut and has no chance of repaying that back uh, at her age, right? Um, considering the, the length of work, right? And so 
I am here representing not just myself, but the countless of borrowers who are part of our organization. SLF is a Connecticut borrower-led, grassroots, nonprofit organization fighting for racial and economic justice, committed to restructuring the predatory lending system and practices that are negatively impacting us, our families, and our communities. We advocate and organize to cancel student debt, make free colleges and universities free, and fight for student loan borrowers for their rights to access free and reliable resources to navigate what we know to be a really complex and unbearable private and federal student loan system. We are leaders, we are artists, we are nonprofit leaders, we're social workers, we're chefs, we're teachers, we're nurses, we're people who haven't had the opportunity to graduate and still carry debt. Connecticut residents know and understand very well the pain of the national student debt crisis. Intimately, intimately, because nearly half a million of Connecticut residents have $17.5 billion in student loans. We are the fifth in the highest, we are the fifth in the nation with the highest student debt holders in the country. And as we've heard before, it disproportionately impacts black, brown communities, low income communities, and women particularly women of color and working class women of color. Students of color, we have to borrow more. Students of color have to borrow more at every stage of the process, leaving us with higher insurmountable debt that is compounded by interest rates and unaffordable and ineffective repayment programs at the national level. So Connecticut must step in to support our leaders, to support our residents, to support our nurses, our teachers, our retail workers, our friends, right? Many workers are left to choose between the increasing cost of housing, food, and basic necessities, and making their monthly payments. Those are real choices people have to make today. Do I pay my student debt? Do I get the, uh, defaulted, or do I eat? Do I pay my rent? We have borrowers with pay monthly payments of $600, $700, $800 a month. We know that as soon as the federal government student loan repayments are reinstated, we are going to see an avalanche of borrowers who are defaulting on their, on their student loans. We know this is coming. This is impacting our nurses, our teachers, and many more. It is affecting our local economy and our community's ability to survive and thrive, right? I am here today because student loan borrowers in this state deserve to be heard, but most importantly, they deserve to be invested in. They, they, they deserve a seat at the table. They deserve resources to support them. We know that HB 6901 is a start, right? But it's a start to much needed help and support for student borrowers across the state, right? So we need to join with student borrowers and recognize this is an intergenerational issue. It is impacting uh, families of color, parents, grandparents who are fitting the bill for the young people to be able to take to go to college, take out loans. So we know that the more we help these borrowers, the more economy thrives, the more we thrive as a community, right? So let's help borrowers, let's help and center their needs um, so that we can continue to create a happier and a thriving Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, I, I want to thank those who put this bill together. This is probably one of our best bills that we're having come before us to alleviate some of the economic debt that some of our students are obtaining as they go to school now. And it was talked about earlier how there's a lot of naysayers out there who speak about, well, I'm not in debt. Well, I don't have to worry about that. Well, I got a responsible job and I was able to pay off the debt. Well, your debt wasn't three times as much. Mm -hmm than the debt that these students are having today. So for you to think that it's okay for you to run out the mouth with the fact of you being out of debt, your debt was not as much as the students that are in debt today. And the students today need to be alleviated of that debt so we can hire for some of the jobs that some of you complain about. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Nursing teachers, mental health, retail. These are all the complaints that we're getting. Well, we're trying to help solve this issue by putting this bill forward. Actions speak louder than words. So you can speak all you want, but we need action. And that's what we're here to stand and do. We are for this bill. HB 6901, easy bill, should pass. Nice one. Nice one. 
Thank you. I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the other two co-introducers of this bill, uh, Representative Eleni Cabros de Graw and Representative Manny Sanchez, who could not be with us today, but they have been uh, diligent in working on this bill. And I just want to give uh, a round of applause to my colleagues who are also here in the House, everyone, especially State Representative Kai Belton. We have also State Representative Jerry Reyes, State Representative Farley Santos, State Representative Ann Hughes. Uh, clearly, we need to thrive. And when we come together to take this over the finish line and to make a difference, Connecticut thrives. When Connecticut thrives, we lead in this country. And that's what we need to do right now. We need to thrive and lead together. And we can't do that when there's not justice for every person in this state in terms of their livelihood and them being able to prosper. We can't sell the American dream to folks if we're not going to help them achieve and recognize that dream within their lifetime and build generational wealth for, their, for those to come after. And we can't do that. We can't be the great Connecticut that we talk about being when we talk about equity if we don't actually have these uncomfortable conversations to address the inequities in this state. We have to take this by the horns. And let's pass this and make a difference for all those who truly need it. This is life changing. At the front end, at the back end, at every end, this is what will help Connecticut thrive. Thank you so much. And we're open for questions as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Just also want to mention that we are having this as a pilot program for this year, which we hope to expand in the years to come. Uh, going, forward? going forward. Students graduating now or past? So anyone who's graduated this under the age of 40 would be able to qualify for this. And the other thing is, too, in which we've gotten a lot of questions around is, how do we differ this bill in terms of what's going on on the federal level? We don't want this bill to obviously end up in the courts with a month's long battle. So what we are asking to do in this pilot program is have the borrower pay back their loan, submit those receipts when they're submitting the you know, credentials showing that they meet all the criteria in order to qualify for this bill, and the state will reimburse them up to $5,000 on their loan. That is the plan in the bill. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, it was rather easy. Thank you all so much for coming. We appreciate you. Thank you. Let's take a break.